my eyes playing tricks on me, here were a couple of what looked like the cryptographic types of runes also seen on the walls of Maze Howe. While quite thrilled at the time, today I am slightly skeptical of the authenticity of these runes. In my review of the literature, I found that it had already been observed by Davidson and Henshaw that in Winford Cairn, one stone has a row of rune-like characters, almost certainly spurious. Yet I am now fairly certain that they're referring to these runes found in the main chamber. My find in the north cell, whether spurious or not, would not be called rune-like characters, but twig runes. I even went through the trouble of translating them. This is the deciphering table provided in the Historic Scotland Tour Book for the Maze Howe Twig Runes. Deciphering involves counting the number of branches on either side of the main stem of a twig rune. I count that the first rune has branch numerals of 1 and 2, the second rune has 1 and 3. Following the solution used at Maze Howe, I plotted the 1 2 rune and got the letter B. For the 1 3 rune, the number of branches corresponded to the letter M. So I had translated these twig runes to read BM. Are they the initials of some adventurous Viking, or a modern imitation? I'll leave that to the experts, although it may never be clear, since I soon found out there was another example of questionable twig runes at the Ring of Brodger. The, the, the one at Brodville, it's, it wasn't mentioned until quite late on in some of the literature, and some people think that it was almost a piece of modern graffiti. Actually, the name says Bjorn. B O B J O R N. Yeah. Backwards. Really? Whether authentic or merely a modern eccentricity, the twig runes and the graffiti at all these places bring up an interesting question about human nature. Why are we humans so compelled to leave our marks on the world around us? Is it as simple as our own attempts to join the Vikings game of going down into history? Is each civilization nothing more than a monumental we were here written on the face of the earth? I found myself drawn to discover the impetus behind graffiti, and the Neolithic monuments nearby proved a very handy starting point. Well, I so. suppose in some ways it's, it's almost like uh, some of the monuments you'll visit in Egypt, uh -huh. uh, which have you know, some wonderful graffiti on them from mm -hmm. uh, both 19th century visitors uh -huh. and you know, even Napoleon when he visited the right. and carved in some of them. It's a way of, you know, in the 19th century, you could actually buy a, a, a special chisel kit, which was designed for going when you, know, you were doing your grand tour of Europe or whatever. You would leave your mark on as many monuments as possible. While only 27 of the original 60 stones of the Ring of Brodger still stand, these weather-beaten slabs still offered a veritable feast for my survey of graffiti. Most of what I found dated from a lifetime ago, if not more. Inscriptions range from neat and stylized lettering to shameless tags. But the larger picture soon became overwhelmingly clear as I scanned along the ring. From the babble of a hundred graffitos to the onerous silence of the stones, I was far, very far, from being the first person to visit this place. Returning to Maze Howe, there was one further point of interest I wanted to explore, and that is the name of the tomb itself. Surely the name we give something reflects its role in our understanding of the world. However, the origins and meaning of the element maze remains mysterious. The Vikings called the tomb Orkhauger, or the Mound of the Orkneymen. This gave me an idea. I decided to ask my fellow archaeologists to characterize Maze Howe, or give it a new name that would be more meaningful to them. 
well, a, a big stalled cairn in Rousey called Midhouse. How mm. is uh, an old Orkney word for a mound, so right. lots of places have that name. Yeah, um, that's a hundred foot long, the stalled cairns, and uh, right. where they found the bodies. And the Vikings called that the Great Ship of Death. The Great Ship of Death. Because they thought uh, it looked like a big Viking ship, but it was full of all these bodies. That's cool. So maybe Maze Howe would be called something similar. But the Great Mound the of, hill death. of Death. The Hill of Death. Yes. Uh, so that's that cool. sounds like a B movie. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, I think I'm quite happy with the name. Yeah. It has the elements of Orcadianness, mm -hmm. which um, makes it stand out as something mm. quite significant and something mm. quite special. And it has, I mean, obviously the Howe name, you get lots of those kind of yeah. uh, connections in Orkney, so that's quite interesting. Yeah, like Chambered Cairns. Yeah, so. I mean, that it has an Orcadian name still is nice, mm -hmm. rather than placing some great kind of mm -hmm. industrialised name onto yeah. it. Mays Howe is, 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 is utterly unique. I mean, there aren't any other monuments like it in Orkney or indeed or in the rest of the British Isles. So from that point of view you can't really say it's part of a typology because the typologies for that for, for unique monuments don't work. It's just like Stonehenge in that respect, it's it's there you know, there, there are no other similar monuments. The, the whole the, the whole concept of it, I don't know how many times I've been into Mays Howe, uh, or dozens, dozens of times. And every time I go in it, there's still that kind of jaw dropping experience of seeing this you know, the, the, to me the, the best bit of prehistoric architecture anywhere in Western Europe. It's right. just so perfect. The Mound of Marvels. The Mound of Marvels. Pandora's Box. Uh, <laughs> anything along those lines. Wow. Uh, yeah, the Mound of Wonders.